Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. Hope that you're having a wonderful day and you're ready to continue in our study through the Gospel of John. Here in a few moments, we'll pick up with chapter 9, right about verse 35 for today's study. Um, if you've joined us on our YouTube side of the world, then feel free to use the chat area connected with this live stream there to let us know what you have to think. If you have any thoughts, questions, or comments, please share them with us. If you've joined us on our Facebook page, then you can use the comment section connected with this live video stream. And again, let us know what you have to think. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. If maybe this is your first time uh, joining us for our study, then let us know at least who you are and where you're from. We'd most certainly love to hear from you. Now, if you would like to contact us via email, you can use the email address questions at truthfactorlive.com. Um, or maybe if you have something against what Paul says, then you can write him an email. Send him a scathing email to paul at truthfactor.com. Whereas if you thought Bob was especially wise in his statement, then you can say, good job, Bob. Uh, Bob. Send it to Bob at truthfactor.com. You kind of see the pattern there. Really, the only different email address is the questions at truthfactorlive.com, just because it makes it stand out a little bit. Not confusing at all, hopefully. hopefully. All right, <clears throat> gentlemen, let's bring everyone into our study today. We have nearly our full complement. The one we are missing, of course, is Brendan. But aside from that, it's good to have everyone back for today's study. Gentlemen, are y'all doing okay? Doing fine. Paul's got a new grandbaby that's growing. Yes, I do. I have two grandchildren now, both uh, from our daughter Hannah and her husband Dylan. And Mason came along uh, last August, and now we have Radley. And uh, they're really special to us, and being a grandparent's just the best. It is. Somebody said, if I would have known how much fun grandchildren were, I'd have had them first. Yeah. <laughs> the only problem with having grandkids first is you don't have anyone to send them home with. <laughs> <laughs> That's the beauty of grandkids. You can play with them, spoil them, give them too much sugar and stuff, and then mom and dad's got to take them home and deal with them. Yeah, I heard yeah, one yeah what are grandchildren? <laughs> I heard one person say that the happiest sight is the headlights of their children bringing their grandchildren. The second happiest is the taillights of them taking their grandchildren back home. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I like that. All right. So we are picking up this morning in John chapter 9. We studied last week down through verse 34. We saw the blind man um, who Jesus... Uh, healed. He restored his sight. There was an interesting point that was made last week, and I think maybe Brian may have brought this up, that the blind man did not know who healed him, at least not by sight, because he had not seen Jesus. Uh, Jesus healed him, and then our Jesus you know, put the mud over his eyes and said, go wash. And then when he came back, Jesus wasn't there. And so when he began to be questioned and he went to the, the temple to present himself, they began to talk to him, you know, who, who healed you? And he basically says, I don't know, other than I know that he did heal me. Well, here in a little bit, you know, after they, they will kick him out of the assembly there, um, Jesus will now come up and find <laughs> him and kind of talk to him more directly. But were there anything, uh, is there anything that you guys wanted to, touch on in this previous section before we continue in verse 35. <clears throat> Anything? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead just, and pick up. Go did ahead. We, did we talk about verse 34 about the being born in his sins? Um, uh, that's kind of an interesting statement, especially because that was kind of a presumption that the mm -hmm. disciples also had, that there was some kind of birth in sin and Jesus, you know, right at the beginning of the chapter, dismissed that idea. And of course, we, we can appreciate understanding better that, that, you know, whether it's Ezekiel 18 or other places that we don't, we're not born in sin. We're not born sinful. We're not even born of the sinful nature um, because our nature is, is made in the image of God. So it's kind of interesting that that's their dismissal of him is a doctrine, a false doctrine 
that uh, still still is around today. And, well, and by the way, oh, go ahead, Bob. In verse uh, eleven, the uh, the once blind man said, uh, "A man called Jesus made made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go wa- go to the pool of Siloam and wash.'" So he didn't know his name. So he yeah, apparently point. hurt in the in the crowd, but he could not have identified him. Yeah, yeah. By, um, to what Brian was saying. That's kind of how the chapter opened. Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he's born blind. And so there's something about the situation that even the leaders upon casting him out said, you were completely born in sins and are are you teaching us? Yeah. Um, no, we didn't talk much about that as far as, we, well, we did have uh, some conversation about it. The simple fact is, um, the idea of someone being born with a disease or a deformity as a punishment from God for their parents' actions. We, we talked about causes, you know, and people can, you know, a child can suffer because of the sins of the parents, but the child himself not be punished by God because of the sins of the parents. Yeah. Um, Okay. And so let's that go. they call attention to that and made that accusation is evidence that it was not commonly held. Yeah. That people are born in sins. So that was not that was not their point. There he was. Yeah. Uh, because uh of Oh, I that's see just, your point. Possibly speaking. They're singling him out. That's right. You were born completely you were completely born in sins and implying that they were not. Yeah. Okay. Right. You know, it's, it's amazing how it's amazing how they engaged in character assassination when they couldn't answer his arguments. Uh, I, I, I I don't know if that sounds familiar today. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, both in the religious world as well as within our society politically and everything else. You can't answer the argument, so you uh, so you go after the what they call the ad hominem attack. And, if you can't and, read. If yeah. you can't reason, ridicule. Yeah, ex- exactly, e- exactly. So they they attacked his character, and uh, and and they falsely attacked his character. I mean, like you said, it's based on a based on a false belief. At least that's the way they pegged him. You know, uh, the same thing as saying Jesus cast out demons by by the devil himself. I mean, I mean uh, that it's just nothing but pure hatred. As far as as far as the declaration, so. yeah, yeah, it's a good point. Good point. <clears throat> All right, so let's go ahead and read, beginning in verse thirty-five. Let's read through the end of the chapter. And Brian, um, would you mind handling that right now? Yeah. So I'll be reading uh, verses uh, thirty-five through forty-one. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking to you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may be made blind. And some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you'd have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore, your sin remains. Okay. So his one statement here, when he says um, that he's the son of God, that'll come up a little bit later, of course, getting getting himself into some trouble there. Um, But it's interesting, Brian, that the guy was so quick to believe what Jesus said. You know, when, when he says, basically, you have both seen him and it is he who's talking with you, he believed. Yeah. And and how did he see him? You know, because we just established he never had physically seen yeah. Jesus. So when he says you have past tense seen him, uh, it helps us to appreciate, especially what he's going to say in verse 39, 40, 41, that we're not just talking about the idea of, of physically seeing something. It's, uh, it's, a, it's that the same way we use that uh, as a, as an analogy or as a, as a metaphor to see is to understand you, 
you've come to understand who he is. So that's kind of the neat point there. Um, the only, you know, one other thing to add, John, is that yeah. I think it's interesting that maybe there's only one other person in the scriptures that Jesus goes to find, uh, that otherwise everybody is coming to Jesus, but uh, potentially it's Philip in John chapter 1. But what I've always found interesting is that verse 35 seems to indicate that Jesus goes to this man. And I've just always thought that's interesting, you know, to say that this man is somebody that Jesus went to him um, to to talk to him about this. I, um, I've i just found that a, a really uh, a really neat thing to think about, that this guy was, again, he's kind of special. We don't know his name, but he's kind of special. Yeah, and of course, you know, bear in mind that this is somebody who all his life has been blind, and now he sees, and he's just been rejected by the religious leaders corrupted so so i mean i mean here's this this point of joy and rejoicing in his life because of what's happened and it's all just been shot down by a literally corrupt corrupt hateful leaders who ought to have known better and uh, he needed to be encouraged and uh so jesus finds him and talks to him so. Well, it was a prime opportunity because he heard that he'd been cast out. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, any additional thoughts on that um, before we look at their, the, the, those who were with him in their reply? You know, this is kind of prescient. Uh, looking forward to John 12, 42 and 43. Uh, he had already been cast out for his believing and uh others would be too or at least they would uh not succumb they would succumb to the threat and refuse to confess jesus not wanting to be put out of the synagogue that's a good point <clears throat> we have a quick uh question here or point comment from jimmy i should say and jimmy says the if the blind man didn't know jesus uh, who um, would he have known the Pharisees or did I misunderstand that he didn't know Jesus? So kind of what, what, what we're the supposition on our part is, is he knew Jesus told him who it was, or at least let's see, coming back to the text, let's make sure I word that right. Bob pointed this out earlier in verse 11. He answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes. So the man knew that the fellow who healed him was named Jesus. Okay. So either he knew by his voice or Jesus introduced himself in a writing that's not here, or one of the people with him told him who, who it was. Um, <clears throat> but as far as visual recognition, he did not see Jesus visually, at least according to the way the text lays it out until, um, he came back from the pool of Siloam and he didn't see Jesus in cause Jesus had gone. It's not until this moment that he physically sees Jesus. Um, but it's a good question. You know, who, how did he know who was around talking about it? Well, at this point he knew the Pharisees were talking to him because he was now given the sight back and he went before them. Now, if I understand uh, the question. And, and again, it does not say you have seen Jesus. It says you have seen him. Him is son of God. Yeah. He had come to understand that this person that healed him, whoever he was, must have been the son of God, a fulfillment of scripture. <clears throat> or at least yeah. a prophet. When, when, when you're reading yeah. his argumentation, um, just on the, the, the testimony alone of what he did, that is what Jesus did, was enough to convince the fellow that he was from God and the Lord heard yeah. him. Right. right. Yeah, you know, uh, living in Jerusalem, um, uh, there was a uh, there was a good possibility that he knew of Jesus before he was healed. I, I, we can't prove that, but yeah. being in Jerusalem, he would have known who the Pharisees were, and being a blind man, you're alert with all your other senses. You know, a blind man knows how to get around. A blind man would know where the Pharisees met, and uh, you know, being that this was somebody that more than the way it described, more than likely he was depended on others to provide for him mm -hmm. you know uh, probably some of the pharisees interacted with him on a somewhat regular basis 
you know, you know, from that standpoint. So, so yeah, he knew who the Pharisee, he knew who the Pharisees were, but by the way, he hadn't seen the Pharisees any more than he had seen Jesus. So, yeah. I mean, and, and that, that's really the bottom line of all this, but he knew where they were and he, and he knew where he was, you know, yeah. uh, during the conversation. And then he finally meets Jesus. You know, he wants to, he wants to see who he is and he, and he does. And of course he worships him. So. Good point. Good point. Now, <clears throat> Paul, I'll ask you this. So in verse 39, and let's pop it back up here. Jesus, in his, um, in his reply to what the fellow says, when he says, Lord, I believe, he says, for judgment I've come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. Now, Jesus, of course, he's talking is this point, <laughs> I guess what I'll ask you, is this point figurative? In that statement right there. Certainly he's not talking about uh, physical sight, <clears throat> if that's what yeah. you're asking. Yeah. Uh, but uh, instead he, he talks, you know, in, in the context of judgment, uh, that those who um, do not see, those who had not realized that, that their eyes could be open to the truth, there were so many people in Jesus's day who thought that they didn't need any enlightening. They didn't need any knowledge. They, you know, and we see this, this is a theme over and over again, that Jesus approaches those uh, who needed to know things and were, were receptive to that. But those who thought they already had it all together, uh, Jesus uh, doesn't have much for. Uh, he came to heal those who were sick. He taught in parables. Uh, in when we read about what Mark says about that, he taught in parables so that in teaching in those parables that those who were really seeking would be able to see the truth, but those who were not really interested, those who were not honest seekers, uh, that they would be just mystified. It would just be uh, beyond their ability to, to understand. So I think that's kind of what Jesus is saying. And he's not talking about seeing physically, uh, having uh, good eyes, but here uh, that there are things they needed to see in a spiritual way that there are some who just had not come to that knowledge, like this blind man, they come to believe in Jesus. And then there are some who think they've got it all together who are never going to see who Jesus really is. And that's, and that's I, one of the I, harder I, aspects yeah. of what Jesus in his teachings the fact where he identifies there'll be those who will never listen and never obey. Yeah. Go ahead, Bob. I jumped in on you there. That's all right. And we see a similar statement down here in verse 41, but we can hold on till we get there. Well, let me ask you this, Bob, since you kind of started us in that direction there. Then in, so in verse 40, then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, are we blind also? Um, do you think that they kind of inferred that he was talking to them or with, were they trying to put themselves on the same level as the blind man or any thoughts on that? They perceive that he's talking about spiritual uh, blindness because they obviously can see physically. And so they're asking him, are you calling us spiritually blind? And then Jesus said, if you were blind, and I, I, I think this is where uh, what Paul said come in, comes into play. If you admitted to your blindness, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see. They were in denial regarding their spiritual blindness. Therefore, your sin remains. <clears throat> and it wasn't until I heard Paul's comments that that became clearer to me, even though I read that in... Uh, uh, a commentary just a little bit ago. Right, point. you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's interesting the con the contrast with the point that Jesus makes. You know, you know, he made that point in verse thirty nine. You know that those who uh, do not see can see, and those who see may let me may be made made blind. Clearly, he's implying that the Pharisees were spiritually blind. But then he turns around in verse 41 and says, but no, you see. Uh, I mean, you spir spiritually you see, but you see wrong. You know, and, and uh, you're condemned because you see and you refuse to accept. 
And that's why your sins remain within you. I see that as a claim on their part that they see. No, and yeah. I oh, yeah. 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 But but Jesus makes the point there in verse number uh, uh, 41. He says, if you were blind, you would have no sin. Uh, you, you, you do see spiritually, but yeah. you see corruptly. You you have, you know, and this goes back to the, the, the Matthew 13, the closed eyes, you know, uh, the, the, the shut ears, the closed eyes, you know, they, they literally stopped. They refused to see the truth. The truth was in front of them. When I see verse 41, I see, I see the pure dishonesty of these people. I mean, you, you know, going back to, going back to talking about the character assassination that, or, uh, you know, logically the, the ad hominem of, uh, ad hominem attack. Usually when somebody attacks somebody's character, they know they're wrong. They know they're guilty. And rather than face up to it, you, you attack the character of the individual. And Jesus is just exposing them. You know, he's exposing their just outright corruption. And, and I know, you know, I've, we've, uh, if, if I can say this without getting too political, you know, we just had an election and it was a very divisive election and so on. And, and I don't care which side you're on, you know, from the standpoint of that, but the dishonesty of the commentators about the other side and on both sides i mean it's just it's a tell it, it it's a tell about their character and that's exactly what we have with these religious leaders here and it's going to get worse i mean we get into chapters 10 and 11 uh, uh it's expedient to murder this man you know rather than let these things go on hey john uh you know when when jesus taught in mark 4 the parable of the sower uh, mm -hmm. And then he taught it publicly. Then he takes uh, the disciples, uh, the 12, uh, privately, and he was alone. And he's with the 12. And in verse 10, it says he, uh, they asked him about the parable. He says, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive. Hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. I think that's a really good uh, parallel to uh, to this, well, I don't know, parallel, but a really good commentary on this is that uh, it's possible to have poor vision and poor hearing strictly in a spiritual way. And Jesus said, I'm teaching these in parables so that the true seekers, those with good and honest hearts, they'll be able to hear and know but there are those who they'll hear these parables and they'll think, oh, well, yeah, that's pretty obvious. So uh, this, when I sow seed, it falls on all kinds of ground. Uh, what's he talking about? Where these close ones to Jesus would come to understand he's talking about hearers and hearts. And I, I would say that those Pharisees in our text in John 9, they were those who they could see. Uh, but they did not perceive. They could hear, but they would not understand. Uh, and if they would just turn, if they would just hear and see and turn, they could be forgiven. But because they're unwilling to do that, they're still in their sins. Yeah, exactly. And 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 uh, this is a choice. This is a choice on their part. They have the truth. They have the ability. So I, I think that's a great point, you know, Paul, that you're making there. They have the ability to accept who uh, to accept the truth. They're just not going to do it. Uh, they absolutely refuse to, and and, and uh, that's why they will stand condemned. And they have no excuse. Yeah, and, you know, I think at least in part, Jesus spoke in riddles and parables to expose the shallowness shallowness of the religious leaders of his day. They were so shallow spiritually, they refused to look beyond the figure to see the meaning behind it. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's work on something that Brian had shared with us, and actually in the, the comment area there. Um, 
Brian, you want to bring in the Matthew 9, verse 12 real quick, because it would kind of connect all this together as another example. Yeah, I see I see what Jesus is saying here as as kind of a parallel to what Jesus had said in Matthew chapter 9, and verse 12, that uh, whenever one more time where they were rejecting him, Jesus uh, said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. You know, and Jesus will say, I've come to seek and save the lost. And we always make the point to say everybody's lost. But Jesus is only going to be able to save those who know they're lost. And I w I've always thought that's a nice parallel to this. Jesus, you know, everybody's blind uh, in a spiritual sense. We're all we're all in the same condition, but not everybody knows they're blind. And that would be the parallel to here that, you know, if you don't know you're blind, you'll never come to the position to be healed. And that's yeah. their circumstance. That's a good point. I'm a little bit jealous. Hang on of Tom and his animatronic cat that he had there in his office. That thing looked lifelike. <clears throat> okay. So not that that's relevant to our study, but I just want to let you know, we did observe that something different was going on in Tom's world. Um, yeah, well, the Pharisees were caterwauling, so. <laughs> I'm slow. I didn't think of that. Um, so the last point here real quick, verse 41, if you were blind, you would have no sin, but now you say, we see, therefore you sin, your sin remains. They basically were indicting themselves as serving as a witness against themselves. Um, the sheer fact that they, you know, said they did see, they are now without excuse because they would have heard and seen everything that Jesus had done. <clears throat> okay. Any other thoughts? All right. What about from you? If you have any thoughts or comments for us, be sure to share them with us. Let us know what you have to think. If, um, if you have a question or comment, uh, wrong button, you can send them to questions at truthfactorlive.com or drop them into the chat area or the comment section of these live of the live video stream. All right, <clears throat> let's come back down to the next chapter. So we're continuing into the next chapter, but it's, it looks like it's the same setting, doesn't it? Like it's the seals, the same conversation here. Um, and there will be some connecting threads that we'll see as we go through this, but let's go ahead and read beginning in verse one. Let's read down through verse six would be a reasonable stopping point. And Tom, if you would, um, read that for us, sir. All right. Okay. Uh, John 10 beginning in verse one. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Tom. So he's still continuing this, this same idea that was started previously. Blind and now can see. Those who can see now be made blind. And Paul, I think you are the you brought up Matthew or Mark chapter four, right around verses uh, nine and ten in, in that section there in eleven. Um, so now we're kind of seeing it build on the idea of hearing but not hearing, is the idea. And he's also going to bring into this section here, um, who is the one that they should be listening to, who is the one that they should go through and and to there. So. <laughs> Um, Tom, starting there in verse one, he says, mostly surely I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Now we have the benefit Tom of looking at this many, many years past and had time to study it and everything. But do you, who's he talking about here? When he says the same as a thief and a robber, who do you think he would be implying is the one who tries to come in but they are not coming in the proper way. Therefore, they are not. They're the thief and the robber. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, he's he's dealing with these corrupt religious leaders. I mean, I mean, they're 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 not following. Uh, uh, they're they're not following God's God's pattern. 
as and basically i think what he's saying is they're trying to steal sheep and 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 i think a good a good analogy of this is over in matthew 23 uh, somewhere around verses uh, uh, eight or nine uh let me find this here real quick Ma matthew 23 let's see where this is uh <clears throat> Yeah, you try, uh, verse 15, yeah, 13 and 15. You know, you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those entering in to go in. Uh, you devour widows' houses for pretense, make long prayers. And then in verse 15, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrite, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. And when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourself. So so uh, that that's the point there. They're looking for followers after them. They're not following God. And, and of course, Jesus is using a very practical illustration that all Jews would have been familiar with, or most Jews. I mean, and that is shepherding. Uh, you know, sh shepherds were very prevalent as far as the Jewish community was concerned. And if I understand based on this text, uh, there were circumstances where what would happen was is... Uh, they would have community sheepfolds, and 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 more than likely there would be somebody, there was somebody who would be in charge probably at all times. There was always somebody that was watching the sheepfold, and the sheepfold knew all the various shepherds who had their flocks in there, and a shepherd could enter in, and if he spoke, his sheep recognized him and they would follow him, and the rest of them would ignore him, or or or, or stay stay behind. And if a stranger comes, they run away. Uh, and so I think that's the point that's being made. The one that's authorized is the one who's the actual shepherd. If somebody climbs a wall, they're trying to steal a sheep, or or something to that effect. And and so Jesus is talking about the he's talking about these same religious leaders who are trying to steal away the honest and trying to steal away those who want to follow after God and trying to make people follow them. Okay. That's a good point. Good point. Um, <clears throat> any other thoughts about this or maybe about the doorkeeper? You know, I think that there's a difference between the door of verses one through six and the door of verses seven through nine. Okay. Uh, in verses one through six, he who enters by the door is the shepherd. Well, Jesus is a shepherd, so he's entering by the door. He's not the door here. Right. The door here, I'm convinced, is Old Testament prophecy. Uh, and, uh, and all the miracles that he did to demonstrate that he was the fulfillment of that, uh, of that pro uh, prophecy. The doorkeeper would be, would be God who opens the door, right. uh, by speaking through him and and to the people uh, through him and uh, and then the people who recognize him as the shepherd they then are the are the sheep then in verse 7 he switches up a little bit and says I'm the door uh, and so there is a she uh, there is a sheepfold already before Jesus comes it is the spiritually minded people of Israel. There has always been a spiritual Israel, even before the new covenant. They always differed from physical Israel. Not everybody who was an Israelite physically was an Israelite spiritually, before and after uh, uh, Jesus. And so to me, he's entering the sheepfold uh, of those who had already uh, become a part of God's people. They just didn't know about the, the end of the law, the, the coming of the end of the law, and the coming introduction of a new covenant. But they knew that there was a, a, a shepherd coming. Yeah. Hey, I, I got to step away for a moment. What I'd like to do is... Um... Someone's supposed to be here at one there. They've just arrived. I'm going to bring in Jimmy's question real quick and then throw you all full screen. And then y'all can just back and forth with Jimmy's question. And I should be back here in a couple minutes. Uh, Jimmy asks, if I, he says, um, I hit the wrong buttons all the way around. Where are we? 
There we go. This is not the only time he uses the sheep and shepherd. What are some parallel passages uh, to this passage there? So I will leave it to y'all and I'll be back in a minute. <clears throat> I think it's a really neat question. Um, you know, one of the interesting things is, is that most of the sheep and shepherd language in the book of John is right here in this chapter. Um, you know, this is the biggest part of it right here as he talks about this. So, so it's kind of neat about this is there's a lot of allusions to this that are outside of the book of John. So you go over to like Matthew and we have the parable of the single sheep, um, that's lost and the 99 that are safe. And, and Jesus describes himself as one that's going out for that. We have also language like, you know, you're going to the lost sheep of Israel. He'll talk about that. Uh, one of my favorite passages, it talks about Jesus looking upon us with compassion because we're sheep without a shepherd. So there's a couple that, Jimmy, that popped to my mind right away that I can think, you know, this this language of sheep and, and the shepherd is really is a really neat kind of language. I'd like to hear what the other guys have to say, too, about this. Well, like I said, I think this is something they can relate to. Yeah, I mean... I mean, in that part of the country, I mean, uh, they literally could relate to it. And Jesus is making all kinds of spiritual applications to these types of things. Uh, so it, it's interesting. So. You know, Isaiah had said, all we like sheep have gone astray. In a sense, we're all sheep. But some of us are still astray. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've got to accept the shepherd and... Uh, and, and come into a right relationship with God by recognizing Jesus as the one true shepherd. Right. And for a while, yeah, it's not used there in Isaiah. It, the implication is there. Right. Yeah, and, and even building on that, I don't know if we want to tie this to sheep and shepherds. Uh, G, John, remember how he introduced Jesus? In, in John uh, chapter 1, I think, the, the Lamb of God yeah. that takes away the sins of the world. So you've got another illustration there. A lamb is a, a young sheep. You know, you know, uh, from that standpoint. So, yeah, uh, uh, shepherds is a great illustration, and of course, uh, we know there's application to that in the church today too. So, I've heard it said that sheep are among the meekest of God's creatures, and but also I've heard that they were among the dumbest of God's creatures, which is why they go all, go astray so often. Uh, you know, it's it's. It's a really interesting study about sheep. Uh, I did, a couple of years ago, I did a lesson just about sheep. And one of the things I did a little study is I, I looked up the, the nature of sheep. And it it really isn't so much that they're not intelligent, but they are they are focused on following. That they, that, they, that they have this innate need to have something to follow. And that if they don't have something to follow, uh, they wander off looking for something to follow. But they say that sheep are, are, are you know, actually can be highly intelligent because they actually can recognize voices, but they even can recognize faces. They say they're one of the few animals that can recognize a face uh, as well as a voice. And so it's, it's uh, you know, as Jesus is saying here, they know my voice, but sheep are actually even smart enough to know faces. There's a, there's a neat story that sheep will come, have learned uh, that when they come to a cattle crossing, uh, they'll lay down and they'll roll across it, you know, because they, they've learned how to uh, overcome those kinds of things. And of course, then they, then they're sheep without a shepherd. So it's, so what I think is interesting. And, and I kind of get, you know, I get frustrated whenever you hear people say, well, I'm no sheep. We're all sheep. You know, um, what, what our big distinction is, is who is your shepherd? You know, uh, and, and I kind of, Bob, you kind of said that and I jumped in on top of your comment there, but, uh, you know, we're all sheep. Every human being is a sheep. You, you know, that's, that's who we are. We're all looking for leadership. We're all looking for something to follow, to have a purpose in our life. And a lot of people, their real problem is they're sheep without a shepherd. And and we're fortunate that Jesus says, I have compassion on us uh, for being sheep without a shepherd. But the worst thing we can be is to is to be sheep without a shepherd. That's not to be sheep, but to be sheep with no yeah. shepherd. Yeah, really you know, it's interesting how all these things are used in Scripture. Uh, when we think about uh, David, you know, the, the very famous psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. Jesus saying that he is the good shepherd when the Lord wanted uh, leaders in his church in the local congregation. Uh, he calls them shepherds. Uh, and so uh, certainly those local shepherds are not uh, in any way uh, as perfect as as Jesus is uh, or as, uh, you know, when he says the Lord is my shepherd in the Old Testament, 
but but just say showing there that people do need that jesus had compassion on those who were like sheep without a, a shepherd uh, and so we, we see that there is a great need of that and if you've ever dealt a whole lot with um with children uh, children like to have boundaries they like to have someone to lead them they like to be told uh, you know what to do you know what's coming up next what's what's going on next we were foster parents for a lot of years and uh, kids who, who and as well as adoptive parents but uh, seeing uh, kids whose lives were just all in disarray uh, they hate that but if they can have structure and leadership and guidance in their lives we, we see the benefit of that it's the same with us as Christians we need to be able to follow uh, our shepherd but we also need good shepherds in other ways in our life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's also another interesting verse. Doesn't use the term sheep or shepherd, but I think it applies to our text. And uh, this is in uh, Matthew 15, 14. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into the ditch. You know, obviously that could be applied to. <laughs> You know the, the points that we're making about shepherds and sheep. You know, and, and what and what they do, wanting to follow something. That's a good point. Good point. Um, <clears throat> one thought before we um, let me check our time. Get into the next section there. Um, and y'all may have already touched on this. One had to step away, but when he talks about my sheep hear my voice, he's not talking about some sort of. Um, predetermined acceptance and rejection on the part of the person. He's talking about someone who has actually heard and accepted what he said, thinking about the, um, in the parable of the sower as given in Mark chapter four. Also, we're supposed to hear and accept and bear fruit. These sheep, the ones who hear his voice, hear his voice because they heard his teachings. Would that be they are Accurate. attuned. They are attuned to the truth. They're looking for the truth, okay. and what <clears throat> Jesus said is just uh, easily seen as the truth to any thinking person. If a person wants to be misled, he can be. But if a person, and that's why it's so difficult to do personal evangelism. People don't want. They don't want the shepherd. They want a shepherd. Mm -hmm. They don't want Jesus to guide them. They just want somebody to guide them. And they want somebody to tell them what to do. They don't want Jesus to tell them what to do. If we go, if we try and try and try to uh, introduce God into the lives of people and, you know, people will say, just leave me alone, leave me alone. And they're telling God to leave them alone. Well, one day God will leave them alone uh, in eternity. And so uh, it, it is sad that, uh, yeah, they, they, although you have those people too that want to be the leader, they don't want anybody to follow them. They, they don't want to be follow anybody. They want to be followed. And uh, what's that? The God complex, I guess you could say. But okay. to me, they recognize the voice of truth because it is consistent with what they already know to be true. Okay. Um, real quick, real quick here. Do you see a connection? Could we make a connection between verse five? Yet yeah, they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from a stranger for they do not voice. Of, they don't know the voice of the strangers. Could we make a connection between there and first John four verse one or second Peter? chapter two, first John four, verse one tells us to test or try the spirits to see whether or not they're from God. Second Peter two warns us about false teachers. Um, the more we know the word of God, the more we are following our shepherd and hearing as the voice, the less likely we will be to be turned aside to another doctrine or to another teacher, to a false teacher, whatever it may be we will remain with Christ because it is truly not just his voice, but his voice also referring to his teachings, his doctrines. We will listen only to that and not to anyone else. Probably make a connection between kind of this statement and those other passages there. 
Okay. All right, let's what's see. So sad, what's so mm-hmm. sad is even we all have, I'm not going to mention any names, obviously, but we've all heard of gospel preachers, mm-hmm. otherwise faithful gospel preachers who have left the truth yep. uh, and, and pursued uh, and, and followed other religious leaders, uh, going into the denominations, for example. Uh, and I'm talking about gospel preachers who have written books that have been much help and comfort to people. Uh, I've got commentaries uh, written by brethren who were sound in one, at one point. And then, uh, and of course, we all, uh, we all probably do, but who have, have left the truth. They left the Lord. Sometimes they say, well, he's left the church. Well, yeah, that's true. But what's important is he's left the Lord. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that uh, is the more accurate way of putting it, Bob. uh, And, uh, and so that's, that's so sad that none of us immune to that. And we live ourselves open to that by our lack of study, poor study habits, Mm -hmm. uh, poor habits of application. But sometimes it's, it's not just study though. It's, so let's say if you have someone you raised in the church, okay, like that, they're raised. Okay. Quote unquote. Yeah. And so they've, and they've heard the truth from men who teach the truth. And so they grow up, they're young, they get married, they have children. Everything is in perfect harmony in their balance in their life. And then something happens and they make a bad decision. It could be an early divorce in their, in their life, or it could be something that comes later on within their marriage, and then something that maybe happens within their children's life, some sort of bad decision somewhere or another that then causes them to determine whether or not they will stand on what they've always believed and taught, or if they will conveniently begin to study so that things are now different. You know, when I, when I first got married, this is what I teach and believe, but you know, I've had some few problems in my life. And now that I look at it, I was wrong way back in what I taught. Sometimes it's not just lack of studying, it's the direction where we study and what has happened in our life that is forcing us or wanting us to alter what we believe so that we're not as laden with guilt. Uh, and that's, that's what I call looking too hard at the, at the problem and not hard enough at the solution. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> that's a good solution. way of- yeah. I believe we should grow in our study and knowledge. I'm not doubting that. And I think a person who begins preaching, he's only been Christian for four or five years. He has a great desire to preach. And so a lot of preachers tell him here, preach this. I'm not saying he can't grow when he may 20 years later, look back and say, I had a weak understanding. Now my understanding is much deeper. I'm not talking, you know, that that's, that's what we should all strive for. But when our changes come because we're trying to adapt to our life and decisions we've made, then that's where we no longer hear the shepherd's voice. We cannot afford to adapt the truth to our experience. Exactly. We've got to adapt our experience to the truth. Yeah. And I have long said, there's no such thing as a spiritual plateau. <clears throat> You're either on an uphill climb or a downhill slide. There's only one place that either one of those can take you uphill climb to heaven, downhill slide to hell. Remind me never go hiking with Bob. He'll never <laughs> let us get a good little stretch where we can kind of back off and take it easy. Yeah, no <laughs> All right. Any but other thoughts, guys? Don't have to worry about ever going hiking with me. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's see. All right, let's check our time. We've got a few minutes remaining. The next section here, um, let's go ahead and we'll break it up. And let's see, Paul, have you read yet? You have read. No, not today. No, okay. Would you read beginning in verse seven and let's read through verse 10. It's kind of a halfway point break sort of, but let's go ahead and do that for sake of time. Sure. So I'll read John 10, seven through 10. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, 
I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. All right. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Going back there to verse 7 there, and Bob pointed this out a while ago. At this point, he will say, I'm the door. In verse 11, he will say, I am the good shepherd there. Um, but here, Paul, it sounds like he is intentionally distinguishing himself from everyone else who would try to come through the door. Yeah, a door is an entrance. And uh, he, he will say in other places that there, you can't come to the Father except through him. And so... Uh, the only way to have the hope that he provides and the only way to have uh, all that Jesus would want to offer uh, would be uh, through him. He is he is not just the door. He is the only door. And I think that's his point here, that anyone else uh, who claims to be that, they're, um, they're not. Uh, they're a thief and a robber, and yeah. uh, they do not have the best interest of the sheep in mind. A good shepherd not only defends his sheep, but he protects them, he feeds them, he makes sure that they are supplied well. And so Jesus says, anyone else, uh, they're not going to provide all that I desire to provide for my sheep. It sounds like a lot like he would be talking about those who would later come claiming to be the Messiah, you know, claiming to have a knowledge of the truth, but if you follow them, you'll find death. Whereas if you follow Jesus only, you'll find life. Yeah, you know, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, uh, when when Bob brought up the fact that the door in verse number two is the Old Testament, that that kind of makes a lot of sense. And I was just thinking about you know tying that to the point that we just made here. I am the door. It, it's almost like uh, they're entering through an old door, and now Jesus is saying, "But I am a new door." You know, first of all, he said, "I'm the shepherd." He says, now I'm a new door, and, and I, I am the door that's going to take you to everlasting life in the new law. Okay. They've got to All enter right. the fold through him. Yeah, ex exactly. And, and, and he's the only entrance into that new door. When, when you say door, what I keep thinking of is the door to my office. Think of something like that. Yeah. But we're talking in the analogy of the sheep, we're talking about a door into the fold or into the corral or, or what it might, you know. Right, or out of the corral. Well, I, I, I guess you'd say into the corral. Yeah. Basically following him wherever he's leading them. Yeah. Exactly. I'm thinking about Matthew 7, 13 and 14, you know, by the, uh, the narrow door. For wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many are they are that enter therein, but uh, narrow is the gate and straight is the way or difficult is the way that leads to life and few there be that find it. And so door simply entrance. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not like the door with a knob on it that you have to open. It's it's open. You just got to walk through it. Yeah. And as he said earlier, there is a doorkeeper. Yeah you know, who will prevent anyone from coming in to lead the sheep away or astray. That's right. Yeah. That's a good point. Also preventing those from who have not repented and confessed faith and been baptized from entering in. And so yeah, I, uh, go ahead, uh, Brian. I, I really, uh, right now, by the way, Bob is doing a series on the mm -hmm. I am statements of Jesus. And uh, so, I, Bob, I don't know if you've even gotten to this one yet, but, uh, you know, this is one of those seven I am statements that Jesus makes in the book of John. I really, I really like to take this and yeah. try to make the comparison. Uh, oh, go ahead. Um, that what we're talking about here is the idea that uh, Jesus will say a little later in John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No one gets to the Father, but I mean, there's only one door to access. And 
And I, what I like to do sometimes is kind of make the point that throughout the Old Testament, there are lots of images of places of salvation that only have one door, like the ark. You know, the, the Bible is specific to say the ark was constructed with only one door. There's only, and that's the place where you're going to be saved. And so anybody who was going to be saved had to go through that door. Um, you know, the, maybe we, we could compare that even to the Passover home, you know, and, and entering into the Passover home, how the door had blood on it. Uh, that you had to go through that in order to be safe from the death of the firstborn as the destroyer came. Uh, how Rahab's house, you know, a, another place of safety, you know, you had to have this uh, imagery of, of, of staying inside that. And so if, if we kind of follow those different analogies, then what we would see is the idea that, you know, that, that in a way we're talking about being baptized into Christ, um, that whenever I'm baptized into Christ, I'm added to the place of safety. I'm added to the the place of security. And in this case, Jesus says, if you come through this door, you'll find salvation. He says in verse nine, you'll, you'll, you know, you'll find, you'll be saved. Um, you know, and that, that this idea has been all through the Bible, that there's a door that when you go through it, you're saved. And, and if Jesus is the door, as many of us who are baptized into Christ, uh, are bad, are, have put on Christ. We, we are going through that door in baptism. We're, we're walking through him and, you know, it just really is an important idea when Jesus says, I am the door, that we see all these different times where there was a single door that led to a place of salvation. And I just love, I love to talk about that. Well, that'd be the latter half of 10. Oh, I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Yeah. yeah. yeah right. Connection with that. Okay. Yeah. Now, isn't it interesting how he says there in verse 9? <laughs> That, that he will be saved and he will go in and out and find pasture. Of course, that's saying that you can't be lost, right? No matter, no matter where you're at. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Well, that's the answer. No. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's one of those. It's, it's kind of what John John uses this for the statement in his uh, the third the three letters of First John. The ESV talks about go. Uh, we go on sinning. You know, and is the idea of where we willfully continue to, to, to live in sin. So if the sheep stop hearing his voice, they quit following him. If they'll continue to hear his voice, then they will right. remain with right. him. Yeah. Well, right. yeah. the, you know, the going right. in and out is going in and out of the sheepfold. Uh, yeah. Out yeah, of I, the fold into the oh. pasture. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. And, and I think the point he's making on that going in and out, uh, we need to be careful not to read too much into it. He's he's just describing the sheep live the sheep living his life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. following I mean, the shepherd. Yeah, yeah, following the shepherd. He's living his life wherever the shepherd takes. It's not saying going in and out of sin. You know, yeah. what, which is which is. I mean, I mean, this is this is one of those texts that advocates of eternal security or once saved always saved i should say because i there's a sense in which i believe in eternal security but once saved always saved yep. you know that uh, uh this is one of the texts they might go into and, and say something like that but it's not teaching that it's just talking about living your life it's teaching, teaching the opposite of it yeah jesus's sheep are not just scraping by uh, he came that they may have life and have it more abundantly uh it's not like they're starving to death it's not like they uh go long periods of time without leadership or water or anything jesus's sheep are well provided for well taken care of and so when we are jesus's sheep uh we have everything that we need amen that's right yep. Yep. all right well Speaking of saying amen, you normally do it when something comes to a close. And so we have to close our study because Brian said amen. Uh, <laughs> actually, we're at the top of the, <laughs> we are at the top of the hour. So let's plan next Thursday, Lord willing, to continue with John chapter 9, verse 11, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And kind of jump back into this conversation here and do some more mining you know, to better understand who the sheep of the shepherd is or are and how we should be living our lives. All right. Any other thoughts? <clears throat> All 
All right, I wanna thank you who have joined us from home. If you've joined us live, thank you so much for your interest in the spiritual matters. As I said before, if you wanna email us, you can send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com. Um, we'll do our best if we receive an email from you, if it's a question or comment, to try to bring it into our next study, especially if it pertains to the current topic at hand. We'll try to bring it in. And so let's, let's go ahead and, and mark this on our calendars. Next Thursday, 11 o'clock Central Time, we'll pick up with John chapter 10, verse 11. All right, appreciate everyone joining us today, and we'll see you again next week. See you, fellas. You have a good one. You too.